Now, the beauty of the Book of Mormon is that not only does it teach powerfully the doctrine of growing grace for grace, like in Nephi's verses, line upon line, precept upon precept, or the promise that Nephi gave, gave us, that if we are advancing and the end comes, death comes, thus saith the Father, we're going to make it. Or Zeezrom's conversation with Alma, that I can go all the way up and know them in full, or I can go all the way down and know nothing concerning mysteries. The Book of Mormon teaches that doctrine well, but it does something else. And today we're gonna to look at that something else we're gonna look at the illustration of Grace for Grace. The Book of Mormon is going to show us, in fact, in a powerful and prominent place, the very beginning of the book. First Nephi, the book of First Nephi, is the story of one young man who grows slowly in light over time. He receives, he sees the situation, he responds, which brings more light into his life. And then he sees with more light. He responds with greater power, and that brings more light. We're gonna watch Nephi grow in light over time. It's a beautiful illustration. And at the same time, we're gonna watch Laman lose light. What corrected him early in 1 Nephi will not correct him later on because he's lost light. He's colder. He's more hardened. And that's because of the way he responded with darkness to the situation. He saw the situation with an ever-growing darkness. He's losing light. I think we could make the assumption that at some point, maybe before 1 Nephi began, or maybe right there at the beginning, Nephi and Laman were about at the same place, the same spiritual plane, maybe when they were young boys. They are not at the same place by the end of 1 Nephi. They have grown dramatically apart. And that story we need to pay attention to. The growth of Nephi over time, line upon line, precept upon precept, receiving, acting, receiving more. And Laman, losing light, and then seeing things more darkly, and then losing light. We're gonna watch those two grow in opposite directions, so that by the end of First Nephi, they are worlds apart. Now, may I suggest that that, that is a commentary that the Lord is beginning the Book of Mormon with an illustration of, of this message that life through journey, that our journey through life is an incremental up moving of light. Receive the light that you have. See the situation with added light and receive more. If you respond like layman, you are growing in darkness. Powerful way to begin the Book of Mormon. So let's jump forward. Let's, if we go to the book of Mosiah, Mormon seems to be throwing in a commentary about Laman and his descendants. He, he caught a pattern. He noticed a pattern. And so in, Mor in Mosiah chapter 10, starting in verse 12, speaking of the Lamanites, it says, they were a wild and ferocious and a bloodthirsty people, believing the tradition of their fathers, which is this. In other words, Mormon looking at this whole history sees a pattern. And this is the tradition. This is how laymen responded. And I think this is how to grow in darkness, if I can say it that way. Here is a pattern of what not to do because laymen is always growing in darkness. And it, it, it starts by how you see the situation, how you use the light that you have to see the situation. So look at the rest of verse 12 and a little bit into 13. And notice if you can see a repeated word. How did Laman see the situation? Notice that repeated word. He always felt wronged. Now, you can look at life, and that's kind of a pessimistic way to look at life. You're focused on yourself and what's not happening to you. Now, go back a couple classes. We know that Christ suffered all human experience, and he knows me well enough to know which human experiences I need. And it takes a little bit of light to trust him, to see in a trial his divine hand. 
that he is leading me and guiding me and growing. But if I see it through darkness and I'm focused on me and not him, I'm going to feel wronged. I'm going to feel like he's not doing what he should in my life. I'm being wronged. Sometimes we hear phrases like, what did I do to deserve this? Or why is this happening to me? I expect something else to happen to me, and it's not. And so I feel wronged. We do that with God. We do that with parents and authority figures. I feel wronged. You're not treating me the way I should be treated. And we see it kind of darkly. Now notice the next few verses. See if you can see a repeated word in the next few verses. If you feel wronged, you're going to feel wrath. You're going to be angry. You're going to be angry at God. You're going to be angry at parents or uh, law enforcement or a judge or your teacher. You're going to be angry because you're seeing the situation through darkness and only how it affects you right now and without the light of trusting that he knows what's best for me. Now look at verse 17. If you feel wronged and get wrath, it's gonna lead to hating and wanting to hurt. There are people that feel that way towards God himself. They see the situation darkly through, through the darkness they feel wronged, that God isn't doing what he should. And they feel wronged and they're angry and they want to hurt him. And the way you hurt God is you walk away from his truths. And we see that happening all over. People who feel wronged by the church or they feel wronged by God or they feel wronged by society or someone who is a member of the church. And they're angry, so they're walking away because they want to hurt God and all the people that follow him. That is an example of how to increase in darkness. You are growing darker. The darkness is growing. You are losing light. Now contrast that with Nephi. I'm gonna to jump to the Doctrine and Covenants because I think this is a beautiful illustration of what Nephi is going to do. Then we'll go back and we'll watch Nephi do it. When the saints were camped at winter quarters and Joseph Smith has been martyred and Brigham Young is now leading the church with plenty of opposition behind us, plenty of challenges behind us, like the Mormon War, like Kirtland, like Joseph Smith's martyrdom, and yet with plenty of challenges ahead of us, like crossing the rest of the plains and building up a desert and building a temple and crickets are coming and Johnston's army is coming, the Lord says this verse in section 136, verse 31. My people must be tried in all things, that they may be prepared to receive the glory which I have for them, even the glory of Zion. And he that will not bear chastisement is not worthy of my kingdom. You've got to see the trials of our lives differently through light, not through darkness. You have to see that God is preparing me for something greater and that I can only have that greater if I respond well to this trial. Now, wouldn't it make sense then if he says in verse 31 that he that won't bear chastisement cannot receive the glory of the kingdom, that he would then point out how to bear chastisement. And notice all of the seeing concepts here. He says in verse 32, let him that is ignorant learn wisdom by humbling himself and calling upon the Lord his God, that his eyes may be opened, that he may see. His ears opened, that he may hear. For my spirit is sent forth into the world to enlighten the humble and contrite and to the condemnation of the ungodly. Do you see that process? Trial comes into my life and it's painful and it hurts. But if I respond humbly and seek God and trust him, if I rely onto the light that I have and I trust his purposes and I seek him out, notice what it says, responding with faith and humility in an adversity leads to light. 
It opens my eyes that I may see. Talk about grace for grace. That's one powerful way to receive light is how I respond to the day-to-day challenges that I face. How do I respond to trial? How do I respond when he plucks or grafts or places me? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm humbly trusting that he knows what's best and I'm seeking him out. I'm turning my face towards him. Instead of feeling wronged and getting angry at him, I humble myself and I turn towards him. My eyes will be opened and I will receive light. Now, do you see grace for grace written all over both of those? One moving in the opposite direction because I feel wronged and I'm getting angry and I'm turning away from God and the darkness is growing. And one where my eyes are continually being opened and I'm receiving light because of the way I respond, because of the way I trust, because of the relationship I'm seeking with Heavenly Father. I'm growing in light. So now let's go through the seven trials. Um, You might see more. I'm just going to focus on seven. Seven trials that both Nephi and Laman go through. We're going to point out what was Nephi's response. How does he look at the room? What does he see with the light that he has? How is Nephi responding? And what growth can we see coming from that response? Then we're going to look at Layman's response. How does Layman see the room? How does he respond? And the the fall. Now, we're going to measure the fall by what does it take for the Lord to correct Layman. Remember, if they don't leave Jerusalem, they are destroyed. And the Book of Mormon is a very different story. We've got to get Layman into America. And so what does it take to get him moving? It's going to take more and more and more because he's losing light. So that's how we're going to measure the loss of layman's light. All right, trial number one, 1 Nephi chapter 2, the command to leave Jerusalem. That must have been a tough trial for all of them. Leave your childhood home. Leave your friends, your school, your associates, everything that you know, and go out into the unknown, go out into the wilderness and live in a tent, leave Jerusalem. So notice how Nephi responded. Again, I think this is so significant. He doesn't appear to want to go. He seems to start with, I don't wanna do this. I don't wanna leave. He says in verse 16, that he had great desires to know the mysteries of God. He's seeking light. He wants more light. But this is a tough challenge. So he, he cries unto the Lord. Now, do you remember that, for, that Doctrine and Covenants 136? If you humble yourself and you call upon God, it's exactly what Nephi does. He cries upon, unto the Lord, and the Lord did visit me and did soften my heart. Did Nephi's heart need to be softened? Did he want to leave Jerusalem? And I think that's a very human response is no one's very excited about trial. He didn't want to go, but he wants light. And so he seeks the Lord and the Lord softens his heart. That's what added light is going to do. He softens Nephi's heart so that he believes and he doesn't rebel. That's Nephi's response is turn to God and receive a softening of the heart. Now, how does Laman respond to all of this? It says in verse 11 that Lehi spake because of the stiff nakedness of Laman and Lemuel. Behold, they did murmur in many things against their father because he was a visionary man and he led them into the wilderness. They they said he's a foolish man, that he's being led by the foolish imaginations of his heart. And thus did Laman and Lemuel, being the eldest, murmur against their father. 
And notice this last part. They murmured because they knew not the dealings of that God who had created them. They are not seeking light. They are not seeking to understand the mysteries of God. They are pushing them away. And they look at the situation and they feel wronged and they're angry and they're trying to hurt. They're trying to hurt Lehi. They call him a foolish man. So what is it that gets them to leave Jerusalem? Remember, if they stay in Jerusalem, they're gonna be destroyed by the Babylonians. So what gets them to leave? Verse 14, it came to pass that my father did speak unto them in the valley of Lemuel with power, being filled with the spirit until their frames did shake before him. And he did confound them that they durst not utter against him. Wherefore they did as he commanded. Now, jump to the boat, the end of 1 Nephi. Lehi is going to again speak with great power, but it will have no effect on Laman and Lemuel. Do you see why? They've lost light. But at least at this point, a stern rebuke from the Lord through Lehi with the Spirit is enough to shake their frames and get them moving in the right direction. So Nephi takes a step up, Laman takes a step down. How do we see what's happening to Nephi? Go to the very end of chapter two. Nephi is chosen as the leader. The Lord says to Nephi, inasmuch as thou shalt keep my commandments, thou shalt be made a ruler and a teacher over thy brethren. There it begins the slow fall of Laman, who's trying to hurt, who calls Lehi a visionary man. And now that response, the softened heart of Nephi, who wants to know the mysteries of God, and now he's going to be called as the leader. Do you see how it begins? Now, trial number two. After they leave, notice the Lord doesn't do it beforehand, but after they leave, he sends them back to get the plates. Now, Nephi's not the same one he was in the first trial. He doesn't seem to need the softening of the heart that he needed before. Do you see what added light is doing to him? Now, that was not an easy task to return to Jerusalem and get the plates. But Nephi's response has become one of the classic verses of the Book of Mormon. Laman said, Lehi says in verse six that Nephi didn't murmur. Instead, what he said was, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded. For I know that the Lord giveth no commandment unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them that they may accomplish the thing which he commandeth them. Is he seeing with added light? His trust in God is growing. He softened my heart. He's with me. And he's added light. Now Nephi sees with added light. And he says, look, I'm going to do it because I know the Lord will help me. His confidence is growing. His power is increasing. He's seeing with added light, which is going to cause more light. You see that process of grace for grace? Nephi is continuing to grow. How does Laman respond? Verse 5, thy brothers murmur, saying it is hard. That's how they say the, saw the situation. Notice it's starting to begin. Nephi looks at the situation through light and says, yeah, it's hard, but the Lord can help us. Laman takes the Lord out of the equation and says, it's just hard. And he murmurs, it's too hard. That's the H word that, that people losing light often use. It's just too hard. So the rest of chapter three is an example of Nephi's growing light. Notice the confidence Nephi shows in verse 15. When it doesn't work, when the first trial doesn't work, he simply says, as the Lord liveth and as we live, we will not go down unto our father in the wilderness until we have accomplished the thing which the Lord hath commanded us. Now that's after a failure. That's after they tried and failed. And Laman wants to give up. Nephi says, no, we're not giving up. This is gonna work. The Lord's gonna help us. Do you see the added light he has? And we're not going back until we've accomplished this and the Lord's gonna help us. So they try again. It fails again. When it fails again, what do we find Laman doing? 
Verse 28, Laman and Lemuel did speak many hard words unto us, their younger brethren, and they did smite us even with a rod. So they've gone from our dad is a fool trying to hurt Lehi to hurting a younger brother. To see the loss of light, to beat with a rod a younger brother. They are hitting him with a rod. So what does it take to get them into Jerusalem and to get those plates? An angel of the Lord came and stood before them and spake unto them. And notice even their response. An angel comes and their response is, how is it possible? Always a dark room for laymen. And yet Nephi was the one that said, hey, the Lord's gonna help us and we're gonna get this accomplished. Do you see the difference between them? In chapter four, notice how much Nephi's being led by the Spirit. His response to their murmuring is, hey, the Lord's greater than all the earth. He's greater than Laban. We can get these plates. And then I love the conversation that's beginning to happen with Nephi. Verse six, I was led by the Spirit, not knowing the things beforehand which I should do. He has becoming a man of light. It is, I think the Book of Mormon is trying to illustrate that his response is leading to the added light that he has. Notice phrases like this in verse 10, I was constrained by the Spirit. Verse 11, the Spirit said unto me. Verse 12, the Spirit said unto me again. That's Nephi. So Laman is falling and Nephi is growing. Now trial number three, let's jump to chapter seven. In this chapter, they're commanded to return to Jerusalem again for Ishmael's daughters. Now that doesn't seem to be a challenge for Laman going into the city to get Ishmael's daughters, but it will become a challenge when they again have to leave the city and go out to the wilderness. Laman and Lemuel will murmur. In fact, that confrontation between Nephi, who's contending against them and saying some, he's quoting scripture, and yet their response, they're going to leave him to die. They're not gonna kill him themselves. That's a day that's coming in the future, but they're gonna leave him in the wilderness to be killed by wild beasts. You see how they're growing in darkness? They're losing light. What is it that gets them to not leave Nephi for dead? The tears of a woman. It says the following. Verse 19, one of the daughters of Ishmael, yea, and also her mother, and one of the sons of Ishmael did plead with my brethren, insomuch that they did soften their hearts and they did cease striving to take away my life. So the pleadings of a woman. Now again, on the boat, Nephi's wife will once again, I think this is Nephi's wife. I think this is the one that Nephi's gonna marry, right? That makes sense to me. I think this same woman, as Nephi's wife on the boat, will plead again for his life and it won't do anything to Laman and Lemuel. It works today because they're here. It won't work on the boat because they're down here. Do you see what's happening to Laman? They are growing He and Lemuel are growing in darkness. But chapter seven, we begin to see a very, very different Nephi coming forward. His confidence is growing, his understanding, he sees differently. He's rebuking them in the next few verses. Verse 12, the Lord is able to do all things according to his will for the children of men, if it so be that they exercise faith in him. This is not the Nephi of chapter two who needed his heart softened. His confidence is growing because he's always responding by seeking the light and receiving it. When they tie him up, notice verse 17, the wisdom in verse 17 I don't know what you would have prayed for, but I would have prayed for the Lord to get me out of that. Nephi doesn't. He says, O Lord, according to my faith which is in thee, wilt thou deliver me from the hands of my brethren? Yea, give me strength that I may burst the bands with which I am bound. And when he said this, the bands were loosed from off his hands and feet. 
Do you see what he's becoming? This man is filling up with light. He's growing. And because of that light, he sees the situation differently and is acting differently. So now we have Nephi jumping ahead and Laman jumping behind. All because of how they treat the light that they have, how they respond in trial. Do they see darkness? Does, do you see darkness like Laman or do you see light like Nephi? Do you trust him? I love this last one in verse 21, after their hearts are softened by the pleadings of a woman and they ask for forgiveness, Nephi did frankly forgive them all that they had done. That's a man that's increasing in light. Now let's jump to chapter 16. What comes next are the tree of life visions. So let's jump to chapter 16. Two trials occur in chapter 16, which show us the light of Nephi and the darkness of Laman and Lemuel and all those who are living like them. Two trials. First, Nephi breaks his bow. And second, Ishmael dies. Now, there's nothing like hunger to make people feel wronged and get wroth and to murmur. It gets so bad that even Lehi murmurs. Nephi, though, doesn't. How does Nephi respond to his broken bow? How does he respond to a painful situation of being hungry? Beautiful insight on how to live your life. This is a beautiful commentary on getting light, seeking light, so I can deal with life this way. When his, bro when his bow breaks and they get hungry because of it, Nephi simply makes another bow. He just builds another bow. I, I trust the Lord will help us. So I'm going to do all that I can to move forward. And he builds another bow. Boy, if that isn't a commentary on everyday life, just do what you can and build another bow, trusting that the Lord will help you. Now contrast that with the end of the chapter when Ishmael dies. I'm gonna focus on Ishmael's daughters. I think they symbolize what's happening to Laman and Lemuel and all of that group. And this is sometimes typical of all of us. I know I do this and I'm suspecting you do this as well. Sometimes when trial hits, instead of building another bow, we react like Laman and Lemuel and the daughters of Ishmael. Notice that the current trial is the death of their father. When he dies, watch what they do. And this is such a tendency in all of us to do the same thing. Verse 35 says, it came to pass that the daughters of Ishmael did mourn exceedingly. Why? Because of the loss of their father. That's today's trial. That's what happened today. You failed the test. Today, I just blew it on a test and I got an, an F on a test. But notice what they do. Because of the loss of our, their father, they mourned, and because of their afflictions in the wilderness. So because I failed the test today, I'm going to go back to every failure I've ever had. I'm going to go back and relive every single time I failed in the past. So now not only is it the weight of today's burden, but it's all of yesterday's burden that are now bearing me down. And no, notice what they say. They murmur against my father saying, our father is dead. That's today's challenge. Yea, and we have wandered much in the wilderness and have suffered much affliction, hunger, thirst, and fatigue. That's yesterday's affliction. But notice what they add. And after all these sufferings, we must yet perish in the wilderness with hunger. They're already anticipating problems in the future. So tomorrow's problem, tomorrow's failures. So I failed the test today and I'm down because of it. And it causes me to relive every failure I've ever experienced in the past and to anticipate failure in the future. I'm never going to pass. I'm never going to succeed. I failed today, I failed yesterday, I'm gonna fail in the future. Do you see the weight of that that they're allowing to crush them? 
And with that weight on their shoulders, with today's problem, yesterday's problem, and tomorrow's problem all weighing them down, notice verse 36, they were desirous to return again to Jerusalem. Now contrast those two in chapter 16. Nephi breaks his bow, doesn't relive any broken bows in the past, doesn't anticipate breaking bows in the future. He just makes another bow. That's what people of light do because they trust that the Lord will help them. I can't see the future. I don't have the light to see the future, but I trust that my life will be filled with light when I get there. And looking back, I see the blessings. Notice how this is illustrated in the next chapter. Looking back, tell me what Nephi sees. Look at chapter 13, verse 2. Sorry. Look at chapter 17, verse 2. As Nephi looks back, he sees great blessings. So great were the blessings of the Lord upon us that while we did live upon raw meat in the wilderness, our women did give plenty of suck for their children and were strong, yea, even like unto the men. And they began to bear their journeyings without murmurings. As Nephi looks back on the past, the light that he's received is illuminating the past as well. And he sees blessings in the past. He sees help and strength. And from his perspective, so great were the blessings of the Lord. Look at what we were able to accomplish. Now contrast that in the very same chapter when Laman looks back. The darkness of today is filling the past with darkness. And that's all he sees is darkness, even though he and Nephi went through the exact same trials. As Laman looks back, he says... Thou art like our father, led away by the foolish imaginations of his heart. And he hath led us out of Jerusalem. And we've wandered in the wilderness for these many years. And our women have toiled, being big with child. And they have borne children in the wilderness and suffered all things, save it were death. And it would have been better that they had died before they came out of Jerusalem than to have suffered these things. How could those two be describing the exact same events? How could they be that far apart? How can Nephi look back and see light and see blessings and God's hand? And it was so good. And Laman looks back at the very same history that they both went through together and sees darkness and says, it was so bad, we should have died before we ever came out here. Do you see how far apart these two are? That's the illustration that the Book of Mormon is trying to say. If you receive light, you grow. Now, Nephi is clearly not the same person in chapter 17 that he was in chapter 2. He has grown slowly, grace for grace, grace to grace over time. Laman has lost light. And to the point where he just doesn't even see what Nephi sees. He's not capable of seeing the room is too dark. He can't see the blessings of the Lord because the room is too dark. But the light in Nephi's room has gone so bright that he can see God's hand even in the wilderness. So there's the invitation. When you break your bow, build a new one. Have enough light and trust and faith to know that help's gonna come, that the Lord's gonna help me. I'm going to get out of this. He's going to be with me. He's going to strengthen me and see the situation with light and trust him and humble yourself and turn to him and build another bow. You don't need to take today's challenge, add yesterday's challenge, anticipate tomorrow's challenge, and with the weight of all of those challenges on our shoulders, give up. There's a great lesson. Now, going back, we have saw in the first challenge, Laman called his dad a fool. In the second one, he beats a younger brother. In the third one, they're leaving Nephi to die. When, the, when they break the bow, they're going to kill him. They're going to kill Nephi. And what stops him? Two things stop him in chapter 16. First, the riding on the side of the Liahona. 
significant words appear on the side of the Liahona that humble them. And then this intriguing verse at the end of chapter 16, what got them on the path? It came to pass that the Lord was with us. Yea, even the voice of the Lord came and did speak many words unto them and did chasten them exceedingly. And after they were chastened by the voice of the Lord, they did turn away their anger and did repent of their sins, insomuch that the Lord did bless us again with food that we did not perish. It's getting harder and harder for the Lord to get them on the right path. A stern rebuke from Lehi, Lehi compared to the voice of God that's shaking them. Do you see that it's the loss of light that's requiring the Lord to get louder and louder? And Nephi doesn't need as much help because his light is increasing. Beautiful illustration of the two. Now, chapter 17 is the building of the boat. Laman and Lemuel mock and murmur. Nephi can't build a boat. They don't see it. The room is too dark to see that anyone, let alone Nephi, their younger brother, could possibly build a boat to get them across the sea. They don't see it. They are filled with darkness in their room. But Nephi is going to build a boat. He trusts the Lord. He doesn't know how. He knows he needs tools, so let me get started on those, and you're going to help me with everything else. Nephi is starting to show what kind of man he is. I love the very end of chapter 17, where Nephi says, if God had commanded me to do all things, I could do them. If he should command me that I should say unto this water, be thou earth, it should be earth. And if I should say it, it would be done. This man is growing into this spiritual giant. Verse 47, he says, I am full of the spirit of God. Him constantly reading the situ looking at the situation with light, humbling himself, turning to God. That promise of section 136, that if you humble yourself and turn to God, your eyes will be opened. This is the same thing we do with our sins. We repent of our sins. We change our transgressions. We fix the pictures on the wall and we get more light. This is the dance with Christ. We need to increase the light and Nephi has increased his light. It's fascinating that he says in verse 45 of Laman and Lemuel that they were past feeling and could not feel his words. They have lost light and cannot be led. They are moving in the wrong direction. You see the contrast just growing? Verse 48 reveals that they were angry with him, desirous to throw him into the depths of the sea. And as they came forth, they're going to kill him. They intend to kill their brother. They are coming forward to kill their brother. But watch what it takes to stop him. Watch the power of God in Nephi that stops Laman and Lemuel. I spake unto them, saying, In the name of the Almighty, I command you that you touch me not, for I am filled with the power of God, even unto the consuming of my flesh. And whosoever shall lay his hands upon me shall wither even as a dried reed. And he shall be as not before the power of God, and God shall smite him. Do you see who this man has become? Now, this is the same one who needed a softening of the heart in the beginning. But line upon line, precept upon precept, a little bit here, a little bit there, receiving light, acting on it, receiving more light, acting on it has led him to become a mighty man filled with the Spirit. They knew it. They knew he could do it. And so, verse 52, I, Nephi, said many things unto my brethren, insomuch that they were confounded and could not contend against me. Neither durst they lay their hands upon me nor touch me with their fingers, even for the space of many days. Now they durst not do this, lest they should wither before me. So powerful was the Spirit of God, and thus it had wrought upon them. 
Now tell me the Lord doesn't have a sense of humor, right? He tells Nephi, stretch forth thine hand again to thy brethren. They shall not wither before me, but I will shock them saith the Lord, and this will I do that they may know that I am the Lord their God. So he stretches forth his hand and he shocks them. And what do they say? Verse 55, we know of a surety that the Lord is with thee, for we know that it is the power of the Lord that has shaken us. And they fell down before me as if they were about to worship me. It's taking more and more power, more and more strength to get them to do the right thing because they have lowered themselves to the point where they have less light. Nephi, on the other hand, is so full of light. He has become a mighty man. And yet these two went through the exact same trials. You get to choose. Do you receive or do you reject? Those who receive get more. You can't say it was the trial that made me strong or the trial that made me weak. It's not that Nephi went through good trials and Laman went through bad trials. They both went through the same trials. But the way you interact with Christ in those trials, the way you turn to him and trust him and seek him is the amount of light you're going to receive. Do you just see that dance happening? It's a beautiful illustration. Let's turn to the last trial and that being the boat. On the boat crossing the sea. Laman and Lemuel start to rejoice and they make merry and I'm sure there was alcohol involved and they are just crude. And in their dancing and in their marrying, they tie up Nephi and they bind him in a very painful way. Now notice that Lehi tries to rebuke them, doesn't work. Worked once when they had so much light, doesn't work on the boat. The tears of Nephi's wife don't work. It worked once. It won't work today. They've lost too much light for that to work. The only thing that works is the threat of destruction from the storm. The storm gets really bad and only when they were about to be destroyed do they untie him. It says, verse 20, there was nothing save it were the power of God which threatened them with destruction could soften their hearts. Therefore, they saw that they were about to be swallowed up in the depths of the sea. They repented of the thing which they had done in so much that they loosed me. The Lord doesn't have a greater, stronger way to get them to repent. Lehi's words didn't work, the tears of the woman. It's only the threat of destruction. That's because they've lost that much light. That's the only thing that will appeal to them. That's how far they've fallen. Nephi, on the other hand, is showing his brilliance. I am so grateful that he wrote verse 16. I'm sure his meekness filter caused him to really struggle to write this. I'm I'm probably guessing the good man that he was didn't want to talk about himself, but I'm so grateful that he did this because I think verse 16 is the secret to always getting more light in whatever situation you're in. Nephi said, nevertheless, I did look unto my God and I did praise him all the day long. And I did not murmur against the Lord because of mine afflictions. That's how you increase light. When you break your bow, you look to God and praise him and trust him and build another one. When you have to leave Jerusalem, you look to God and pray unto him and he softens your heart. Do you see that's the solution to every stage of light you're in? Turn to him, seek him, fix the pictures, have a good attitude and you'll receive light. And then you'll have more light to see the next situation. I love that when they loose him, verse 21, when they loose him, he took the compass and it did work whether he desired it. He says, it came to pass that I prayed unto the Lord and after I prayed, the winds did cease and the storm did cease and there was a great calm. Do you see what he's become? Now, this is a long story. I know it happens in 18 chapters but this is a long period of time. 
2 Nephi chapter 5, when they leave their brethren and they settle into their own land, he says it's been somewhere between 30 and 40 years since they left Jerusalem. This is a long period of time that Nephi has grown and advanced. It doesn't happen overnight. But I love the fact that the Book of Mormon begins with a powerful illustration of grace for grace. It is how we are to grow in this life. You are not expected to be perfect. Just fix the things that you can see need to be fixed. Trust him in those trials. Lean on him. Pray. Ask him to soften your heart. And then the light comes. And when the light comes, we'll have greater confidence to keep doing that. May we, like Nephi, grow grace for grace, line upon line, here a little and there a little. May we avoid the temptation of laymen to take today's failure and add yesterday's failure and anticipate tomorrow's failure. May we not look at the situation and, and see that we're getting the short end and trust and be angry because we feel like we're being wronged. Take the light that you have and see the hand of the Lord in your life. I bear you my testimony that growth comes line upon line and that if we follow that path, we can become men and women like Nephi. But the opposite it is true. If instead we always choose to murmur and we reject the light, we will lose that light and become more and more like Laman. May we be more like Nephi in all of our trials, in everyday life, whenever our bowl breaks, is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let me give you a thought question. As you look at Nephi, do you see a time when you responded to a trial like Nephi and can you look back and see the growth that came from the way you responded? If you'd like to tackle the other one, do you see a time where you or someone else kind of had layman's attitude and felt wronged and were angry? Can you now look back and see the result of having that type of an attitude? Do you see Nephi-like growth in your life and what was the cause of it? Do you also recognize periods of layman-like f- f- fall And what was the cause of it? What do you learn from Nephi about grace for grace growth? 